Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Shlomi Dinar. Uh, I'm Associate Dean in the Stephen J. Green School of International Public Affairs. And on behalf of the Green School and our founding Dean, John F. Stack Jr., I wanna welcome you to our event this afternoon. Uh, it is really a pleasure to have all of you here with us today. Before we begin, uh, I wanna take a moment to thank uh, the, our co-sponsors of today's presentation, as well as recognize a few individuals. Uh, so let me begin, first of all, with the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in the United States, the World Affairs Council, the European and Eurasian Studies Program, the Miami, Florida Jean Monnet European Center of Excellence, and the Dorothea Green Lecture Series and the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. And I also, of course, want to thank uh, Pedro Bota, who will be joining us in a few minutes, Marcus Thiel, Christine Cali, uh, Jeanette Garcia Montez, and Dana Fernandez. So thank you to the team, if you will, uh, for, for putting up this, uh, helping us with this particular event. A very special thank you to our friends at the Consulate General of the Netherlands in Miami, uh, who are critical in making this event possible. I would like to recognize Luke Niemann, Deputy Consul General, and Jonas Kenston, Economic Policy Officer. Thank you so much for, for being here and for helping working with us on this event. I would also like to recognize the Honorable Catalin uh, Ge Gehenea, a Consul General of Romania in Miami, uh, Desmond Al Ufohai, the Director for Protocol and International Affairs of Miami Dade Aviation Department, and Lenary Robbins, Director of Global Chamber Miami. Thank you also uh, for your work with us on this particular uh, event. Um, we are delighted to host His Excellency. Andre Haspels, Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United States. We are fortunate to have the opportunity to hear from a major European partner about the state of the Transatlantic Alliance. Not only a critically important relationship with the security of Europe and North America, but a vital partnership for global security as well. On the heels of the Russian invasion of a sovereign and democratic Ukraine, we can argue that the Transatlantic Alliance is more important than ever. The world is watching to see how the West will continue to respond to this act of aggression by Vladimir Putin. It is difficult to predict the outcome of this conflict, but one thing is certain. We have not seen such a dramatic galvanization of the West since perhaps the Second World War. And perhaps some would argue even more significant than that onerous conflict which saw many countries of the West sitting on the fence. The wake up call, is evident. Democracy and democratic principles are vulnerable and waning. Very real forces are afoot in the world that would undermine democratic societies to their advantage. How will the transatlantic, how will the transatlantic alliance respond to this threat? It is now my pleasure to turn the podium over to Aaron Rosen, president of the World Affairs Council Miami, to say a few words. Thank you, Associate Dean. Thank you to FIU's Stephen Green School, uh, the Miami, Florida, Jean Monnet European Center of Excellence, and of course, the Consulate General of the Netherlands in Miami and the Dutch Embassy in Washington for putting together this timely event in support of the, uh, the ambassador's visit to Miami. My name is Aaron Rosen. I serve as the president of the World Affairs Council of Miami. We are an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and we are proud to offer our support on this collaborative event. I'd like to briefly recognize our secretary of the board, Lanair Robbins, whose leadership spearheads our participation in informative events like this one today. Ambassador, welcome. We wish you success in your visit in Miami in support of the 30 plus Dutch organizations who are in town currently working to connect with partners in the US sports industry uh, during Soccer X this week. In light of your commitments, we sincerely appreciate your time here today to discuss the value of, of the transatlantic relationship. Before Russia's horrifying invasion of Ukraine, this discussion may have been to some, it, it may have appeared somewhat abstract. After all, it's always been a professional challenge for diplomats to speak on intangible concepts such as shared norms, common values, and unbreakable bonds. Now, however, as Ukrainians face down an existential threat and the world faces a return of war to Europe, those characteristics 
which define US-Dutch relations and the transatlantic alliance more broadly have never been more clear and have never been more vital. We therefore welcome your perspective today, Ambassador, and are grateful to FIU for hosting this event. And uh, op Nederlands, uh, het is een eer om samen te werken met Nederlandse diplomatie in de Verenigde Staten. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, welcome everyone in person here, as well as online, our visitors from Facebook Live. My name is Marcus Thiel. I'm an um, associate professor for international relations at um, SIPA, the School of International Public Affairs here at FIU, and direct the EU Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, one of um, you know about eight centers of excellence funded by the European Union for research-based activities and outreach in the United States and across the world. So it is my pleasure to have you all here online again, as well as in person for this hybrid event for the visit of uh, His Excellency Dutch Ambassador Haspels. Thank you very much for joining us here at FIU. Um, in the coming hour that we have with you, um, we'll hear from you for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then you have the chance to ask him questions. Um, questions that we'll take, by the way, online, as well as questions, of course, from you, from the audience. So if you have a questions, a question, please get up and um, get behind one of the microphones. Um, so any questions that relate, of course, to the topic of the talk, European politics, transatlantic relations, and so on and so on. Um, but before I introduce the Dutch ambassador, welcome, Council General, you know, um, I want to thank the European Commission for funding our research and outreach activities, as well as the, the Green School for International and Public Affairs, especially the Dean's Office, Associate Dean Stack, Dean, uh, Dean Stack, Associate Dean Dinar, and Pedro Botta, our Director of Strategic Init Initiatives. Particular thanks goes to our community collaborators um, that you just heard from, the World Affairs Council Miami, which has a great program on its own uh, to rival ours, and to my Associate Director, Madame Christine Kali. And of course, um, the Dutch Consulate, the Dutch Embassy, and the Dutch Ambassador Haspels, who will help us in the next 45 minutes make sense of the complex geopolitical challenges that we find ourselves and that finds the Netherlands itself. And now, a few words about Ambassador Haspels. Um, he is the Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to the United States based in Washington, D.C. since 2019. He studied politics at the Free University of Amsterdam. And in 1987, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he served in many capacities, including as second national Dutch expert to the European Union. So he has a lot of background on that side as well. In 1997, he became head of the political department at the Embassy of South Africa, where he was involved in the cooperation between the two nations, among others in the setup of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Commission. Sorry. He later served as ambassador in Vietnam and as well as South Africa, and most recently as director general of political affairs in The Hague, the Dutch capital. And so he has a broad range of expertise in foreign policy, development policy, etc. It's our pleasure to host you, Ambassador Ambassadors. Thank you very much for coming. The next, the floor is yours. Thank you. Now I put this on, this should work. Can I be heard? Okay, right. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Um, thank you for, uh, to the uh, FIU. Um, great to be here. Thank you for the World Affairs Council. Um, before I start, let me let me make a, a few observations on the current war that is going on in Europe at the moment. It has been referred to already. <coughs> um, first of all, I mean, it is it is almost incredible that war has returned to Europe again. Uh, after 30 years in former Yugoslavia, 60 years after the invasion of the then Soviet Union uh, to Eastern Europe, including uh, uh, countries like Hungary and, um, and uh, then Czechoslovakia. Uh, and of course, more than 75 years after the end of the Second World War. Um, it is clear that this is due to the Russian aggression. Um, we very much support the Ukrainian people, the brave Ukrainian people. And I'm sure you've all followed that, it <coughs> over the past couple of years, but the measures that have been taken 
against Russia are unprecedented. Just to mention a few uh, financial measures, including financial sanctions against the Russian central bank. Um, the SWIFT system is not operational anymore for uh, transactions uh, with Russia, which is a huge blow to their economy. Uh, sanctions, of course, against uh, tech companies, including not exporting vital uh, technology components anymore to Russian companies and the Russian state, because as you know, state and companies are often the same. We've put a lot of Russian oligarchs on the sanction list, so individual sanctions uh, sank, uh, 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 targeted against individual Russians. Um, there are, of course, the, um, the, uh, the energy sanctions. Um, airlines not flying anymore to Russia and not welcome anymore in Europe. So it's a huge, it's a huge package of sanctions that we have taken against Russia. We have also, we is the EU, uh, taken measures um, uh, against Belarus because they are complicit of this war. Their territory is made available for Russian soldiers and from there attacks are being made uh, to Ukraine. Many European countries also decided to start um, supplying arms to Ukraine, which is quite unique, uh, including Germany, which is even more unique if you know the German background. Um, plus a large flow of migrants now leaving or immigrants, people leaving Ukraine, mainly women and children, are, um, are, are welcomed at our European borders and mainly the countries that are close to Ukraine, including Poland, Hungary, uh, but also other countries like Romania, uh, Bulgaria, have a lot of, um, of migrants, immigrants coming from Ukraine, including the Netherlands. Over 3,000 people have uh, reached the Netherlands in the meantime. We try to host them uh, and find a place for them. There is, as you might know, an EU-Ukraine association agreement. That means that they are not considered as asylum seekers, but that they can work and live immediately in, in European countries. Um, so that is where we are at the moment. Uh, but I thought it would be appropriate to... Uh, to say a few words on the war, because this is not only a war um, against Ukraine, this is also a war against the international legal order. This is a war against respecting boundaries. Um, this is a war against all the arrangements that we have made in the UN. And you, I'm sure you have seen the, um, the voting in the UN and the voting of the General Assembly. 141 countries condemned the, um, the Russian aggression. Five still supported the Russian side. And there were also, I must say, quite a few African countries, especially, but also some in the Middle East that abstained. So it also means that not everybody in, in the world is convinced about condemning the aggression in Ukraine, including China. And I'm sure we'll speak about China later. Uh, but that is one of the other challenges that we are facing, not only how we are dealing with an an, a, a, an aggressive dictator from Russia, but also how we deal with a more authori authoritarian state from China. All right. Now, let me say a few words about the Netherlands. Um, maybe just a question to you. I mean, if you think about the Netherlands, what is something that comes into your mind first that helps me a little bit by saying something to you? Go ahead. Sorry, I'm still a bit deaf because I just came from the airport, so. Ajax, okay, that's very good. That uh, happens to be my uh, favorite soccer uh, uh, club. Not everybody uh, from the Netherlands support it, but that's okay. We are, I'm here as well, by the way, for Soccer X, a big uh, soccer exhibition currently taking place. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here as well. Anything else? You just say, I. sorry? PSV football team. Okay, so we have Ajax, we have PSV, then we cross out Feyenoord as well. We've had that. So we have had Amsterdam, Eindhoven, Rotterdam. Okay. Dutch. 
artwork okay very good yeah that Bike. goes from from the uh sorry Bike. biking is very popular indeed we are bikers vivid bikers i'll tell, say something about that as well handball van gogh yes that fits into the uh the artists the painters it goes back from the old masters uh to closer to um impressionists uh, like like van gogh uh and mondrian you might know uh early last century uh yes i mean the painters and especially the old masters are famous if i ask this question then often it's also being said indeed biking the biking because we are a flat country more than 30 percent of our country is below sea level um that's hard to understand if you uh, don't live below sea level but that's okay you should see it like this we have the sea you have the dikes then it goes behind the dikes lower than the sea if you land at schiphol airport in amsterdam you are low below sea level and then gradually it goes up again uh, to the German border and to the south, to the Belgian border. All right, that's the Netherlands. What you also should know about the Netherlands is that we are a founding member of the EU, one of the six. Uh, we are also a founding member of NATO. Uh, and that means that we are a relatively small country, 17 million inhabitants. Um, and that means that we are exporting a lot. Uh, all kind of products, but we are also having the best, the biggest European port in Rotterdam. Uh, so transport is very important for us, also for goods going to Germany and other European countries. So we are very much outward orientated. And that means that our economy very much depends on the outside world and that we think it is in our interest to be part of an alliance, whether it's the EU, whether it's NATO, but also, you know, UN is important to us. All the multi, the whole multilateral system is important to us. Um, if I look at the, um, <clears throat> the EU, um, you'll see that we have had moments in European integration uh, that then we just discussed that that gave input to the further uh, European development. The single market obviously was one. Well, Second World War obviously was one of them. Then the, Europe, the internal market with one European currency, uh, enlargement process going to the current uh, 27 member states. Uh, so every time there is another step that we are taking in the European integration, and the Netherlands is always in favor of taking a next step. Again, from that idea that we, have, that we are stronger in an outside world uh, than we are alone. Um, if you look at our economy very briefly, it's broad. Um, by the way, I didn't know that, but in my brief, it said that the Florida economy is more or less as big as the Dutch economy. So that gives you an idea. And if you look at Florida and what we are doing here, it's mainly maritime, it's sustainability uh, and mobility, including biking. So if we have possibilities for exporting our biking products here, not only the bikes itself, but also the knowledge on special bike lanes and how you make the city more accessible for bikes. We're happy to do that. And of course, soccer. Soccer is popular, uh, broader. I mean, I should actually say sports. I mean, soccer is one of them, obviously, but baseball is also. We have, by the way, if I talk about the Kingdom of the Netherlands, it's not only mainland Europe where we have our territory, but also in the Caribbean. Caribbean uh, uh, islands are part of the kingdom, like Aruba, Curaçao, St. Marte, and some of your famous baseball players are from uh, from uh, Aruba and Curaçao. Um, if I look at our cooperation, so the cooperation between the Netherlands and the United States, it's partly a bilateral cooperation and it's partly an EU cooperation. Bilaterally is of course the economy. I mentioned that already. We are the fifth biggest investor in the United States. You are the United States, the biggest investor in the Netherlands. You are creating for about 200,000 jobs in my country. And Dutch companies uh, create for about 850,000 jobs in the United States. Now, famous Dutch companies are uh, Heineken, Philips, DSM, KLM Airlines, some financial sectors. I used to say until recently uh, Unilever and Shell, but you might know, unfortunately, that they've moved their head office to, uh, to London. Uh, but there are quite a few big Dutch companies who are active here in the United States, but also in, uh, in Florida. Um, then if you look at our bilateral cooperation, we have a strong defense cooperation with the United States. We are uh, 
working on the F-35, the uh, airplane, uh, the air fighters. Uh, we are not only buying them from you, but we are also doing the maintenance, the training in many uh, American uh, military bases. Dutch pilots are being trained for fighter planes, for helicopters. Uh, so that's a strong cooperation in the area of security and defense between our two countries. Uh, then there are cultural ties. I mean, uh, art has already been mentioned, but it's also broader. It's digital uh, cooperation, it's libraries, it's um, performance art. Um, we work closely co uh, together politically and the sanctions that I just mentioned uh, between or uh, against uh, Russia are, are, are taken, not many of them are taken collectively by the EU and by the United States. And we are very grateful for that. Now, if you, so these are bilateral cooperations. If you look at our EU cooperation between uh, EU and the United States, what you see actually, if you want to see some kind of division of labor is that, um, uh, of course, first of all, the commission is responsible for trade policy. So all trade related issues are dealt with in the framework of the EU. Uh, think about special preferences, sanctions. I mean, you cannot sanction an individual European country because we have one open free economic space area. So, I mean, you cannot sanction the Netherlands, but not Germany because we have a free flow of goods and finances and persons. So that you have to see the EU as a whole when it comes to trade policy. Um, then, uh, that's, and I must say recently, we have created a number of uh, bodies of fora where we closely work together. Let me give you two examples. There is the EU Energy Forum, where we discuss important issues like energy. So that's the EU member states, but it's represented by the Commission and the Council who have a mandate from the member states to act on their behalf. And they discuss with the, uh, with the United States issues of mutual uh, uh, importance. And the other example that I would like to mention is the Trade and Technology Council, which is a huge uh, body where we work together on, as it says, technology issues. Everything when it comes to the digital techs, when it comes to how do we deal with big tech companies. This is not an issue alone for the Netherlands or alone for Germany or for Romania or Bulgaria or what, you know, it's an issue from, for all the EU member states of great relevance. So where we see that there is added value in working together in the EU, we, um, we focus on the EU level. Um, as you know, every member state in the EU has a commissioner. We, are, uh, we have a, a climate commissioner. Frans Timmermans, who used to be foreign minister as well. Um, he works very much on green, a green Europe, and we have very ambitious targets when it comes to making uh, Europe greener, uh, both when it comes to adaptation and mitigation. Um, we work together closely with the United States. We have, of course, differences in our economy, but there are similarities as well. We are very grateful that under the Biden administration, uh, you decided to come back again to the Paris Agreement and the Climate Agreement, which I think is of uh, huge relevance. And then, of course, and I referred it already briefly uh, in, my, in my introduction, uh, how do we deal with China? Um, there is a difference if you look at China from the American perspective or the EU perspective. I already mentioned in the beginning that we are very much dependent on the outside world. The United States, to a large extent, is in some ways um, can sustain itself when it comes to energy, for instance, to a large extent, you can do without outside energy resources, not completely, but you can do it to a large extent. We cannot. So we have to import our energy from other countries. And that's why the strong sanctions that we have taken against Russia will also affect us. Us means the individual EU member states, the citizens, apart from inflation that we'll have everywhere, including in your country. Um, we ask something from our companies uh, that have been doing uh, business with uh, Russia. We ask something from our population that have to pay higher uh, prices when it comes to fuel. I mean, you are sometimes complaining that your, full, your fuel is expensive. Our fuel in Europe is, as far, is, as, is for about four times more expensive than here in the United States. Uh, and of course, we have a government that, um, that compensates something, but not everything. 
And maybe that's the last remark that I would like to make. And some people mention that as well when I say, what do you know about the Netherlands? If you look at our political system, and that's a big difference with your uh, system, you have a two-party system, more or less, red and blue. We have 150 seats in our parliament, 150 seats. How many parties do you think we have? Make a guess. 20? Yeah. That's right. Well, it's 19. <laughs> because we thought there would be a split, but it, this person decided to join it from a party again. Okay, 19. That's a lot, I must uh, honestly say. In Germany, there is a kind of threshold. You need to have 5% of the votes before you can go to parliament. We don't have that. 19 is a lot, I must say. Um, we have the biggest party is our liberal party, led by our prime minister, Mark Rutte, already for more than 10 years. Uh, and then you have Christian Democrats, you have Greens, you have another liberal party, you have more extreme parties at the left and the right, you have the Socialist Party, well, it's a lot. Individual parties that only look after the interest of farmers, animals. Okay. The big disadvantage of a multi-party democracy is that it is very hard to steer, especially in times of crisis, quickly to certain goals that you want to achieve because you have to consult each other uh, you have to find a parliamentary majority our current government who started in january has four is a far four party coalition and those four parties have a majority in parliament but not a lot so um, they should be careful in maneuvering so the disadvantage is sometimes that there's a lot of consultation there's always a compromise uh, and that it's never one party that can go ahead and say, listen, I have the majority, so I'm just going there. It doesn't matter what all the others think. But that disadvantage is also, in my view, an advantage. Because we always have a compromise. And a compromise means that nobody gets 100% what he or she wants. But it also means that there's always something in the compromise of which the parties say, okay, that's fine. I can live with that. That's of interest for my party or for my voters. Uh, so compromise, in my view, is not necessarily a bad thing uh, because, and I think that is the strength of a democracy, in a democracy, it's not only the majority that decides. That is too easy. In a democracy, the quality of a, of a democracy can be assessed by how we deal with minorities and with the rights of minorities, whether it's specific population groups with a cultural background, whether it's LGBTI, whether it's any minority in your country, the quality of your democracy is defined by how you deal with your minorities. And also if you can take other interests of other groups not belonging to your party or your group into account. So again, a 19 party system has disadvantages, but I think it also has, uh, uh, it has strong adv advantages. Um, and crucial, of course, is a debate in a democracy. And I think that's one of the challenges that we are all facing because like in your country, also in my country, there's more polarization. A number of reasons have been mentioned for that, whether it's social media, whether it was the pandemic, whether it's something else. But I think the core issue of our democracies is the quality of our debate. And then finally, maybe about the bilateral relation with the United States. We are very grateful to work together. You have been a partner for a long time. Actually, the Netherlands was the first country to recognize the uh, young uh, United States, the first country after your uh, liberation war, because one of our Caribbean islands sent a gun salute when an American boat entered uh, the, the port. Uh, and a gun salute at that time meant that, meant that you do not only welcome that ship that sails into the harbor, but that you also recognize the fact that that ship came from, in this case, the United States. So we are an old ally that has, uh, we are very grateful for what you have done for us during the Second World War and also after with the Marshall Plan. Uh, and since then, I think our cooperation has been very strong. For me, the task as an ambassador is to support that cooperation in the areas that I just mentioned. We have five consulates general. One of them is here in, the, in Miami for 
Florida and other states in the South. We also have consulates general in Chicago, in New York, in um, uh, Atlanta uh, and in San Francisco. All of them focus on economic cooperation, a little bit depending on the state. San Francisco does a lot of startups. Um, Chicago is more for the Midwest with a strong agricultural component. Miami does a lot, as I mentioned already, on sports, the Caribbean part. Uh, but also, you know, Miami is becoming more and more um, important when it comes to tech, tech companies, digitalization, mobility issues, the maritime sector, obviously, building and maintenance of ships in many areas. So that's what we, you know, and I as an ambassador do with my team. We support the bilateral relations between our two countries. Maybe as a kickoff. Is that enough? Thank you. It's great. All right. <laughs> So that means thank you very much. Um, that was a really excellent overview um, for the ones who you know don't know much about the Netherlands. Um, if you study Europe, you know that the Netherlands definitely punch above their weight, right? Above their um, population weight, if I may say so. Um, I have plenty of questions, but of course, um, since this is really a community um, target event, I want to give you you the first chance to ask a couple of questions please don't be shy also to our on sorry i'm not sure if i'm in there also to our um, online audience please um, feel free to ask any questions and Ernesto, you can channel right questions to you yeah come here you're in the don't, don't worry yes 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 thank you um yes so um any questions directly here from the audience please if you can do us the favor and go to the mic so that you know also for taping and editing purposes you are here heard no Someone, yes please um would you would you mind i mean if you can get yes i think whichever is yeah thank you and if you can just quickly introduce yourself you know who you are um my name is Adrian. I'm a student here at FIU majoring in business. So uh, what I wanted to ask you is the situation that's going on in Ukraine, as you discussed, what do you think the long-term effects, not the short-term, uh, with your economy and the U.S.'s? What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think it is a fundamental change, what's going on now. And I think one of the, the consequences will be that we will that we will accelerate our energy independence from Russia. So in a way, the climate debate will get an impetus as, as a strong support from you know, the fact that we want to become less dependent from Russian oil and gas. Um, that's one thing. That means that we have to look for other uh, suppliers in Europe, outside Europe, but it also means that we have to accelerate our innovations in green energy, wind, solar, hydro, what you have. Then I think for the security architecture, it means that we have to, I mean, basically we have had the privilege after 1990 and the fall of the Iron Curtain to focus on our economy. And to be honest, we have left, we've left our security efforts. We've put it a little bit aside, our investment in security, because the idea, you know, there's no cold war anymore. The world is flat, Friedman, we will all become more or less the same. Uh, so we don't need to invest anymore in, uh, in, in defense. That has proven to be completely wrong with the invasion of Ukraine. So it means that, I mean, economy remains important, but the number one on the political priority list will be security. And I mentioned the huge decision that the Germans have made by investing much more, 100 billion in their defense. Now, that doesn't mean that tomorrow you have a stronger defense. Eh? It will take for about five to 10 years before you can really uh, invest in your material, in the training of the people that need to use this material and all that, but still. So that's a huge consequence. By the way, for my country, we, are, we were below um, the European average and certainly below the 2% that we agreed upon uh, in the NATO frame <laughs> in, uh, in Wales. And uh, President, former President Trump rightly uh, addressed us and he said that you know we should live up to our commitments so I'm, I'm glad to say that we are now in our new government almost at the end of the four year at the two percent but I'm sure that this will lead to more so that is going to change and then the other big change long term as you ask is our relationship with China because until recently China has been very much in our focus on the one hand it's a 
it's an ally. I mean, in a way, a partner when it comes to doing trade and business. We still export a lot of products for, to China. We still import a lot of products from China in many area. You do, by the way, by the, by the, by the, way, the same. Uh, in, the, in the chips industry, in manufacturing. So China, is, is for a part, is a trading partner, but it's also a systemic rival. Uh, and the way they do their business, the way they protect their markets, the way they operate with cyber attacks, the way they, um, well, the way they do business uh, is not in line with we, the West, the United States and Europe, uh, see, the, 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 see that as in line with rules and regulations. And again, I think one of the mistakes that we also made, the world is flat, that when China joined the WTO, Bill Clinton said it, that China would become more or less like us. Well, it's true that that has not happened. And China is a security risk as well. Uh, Taiwan is the most obvious uh, thing, but China has invested a lot in their economy and in their military as well. So you need to have a countervailing power in both areas against China. And that's not only what we say, it's not only what you say, but that's also what many countries in the region, in the Indo-Pacific region say, Japan, South Korea, Australia. So I think that will be not so much, that will be another challenge, what they call the two theater approach. We have to focus on Russia now, but we also have to maintain our focus on how to deal with China and the security risks that are involved. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please, if you can. Ladies first, yeah. Ladies first, Hello. if you can go. You can go to the oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, first off, just wanted to thank you for all the remarks. Uh, I've learned a lot more about the Netherlands than I think I ever have <laughs> in this past 30 minutes. Um, so my name is Mia Rodriguez. I'm a freshman studying political science this year at FIU. And one of the things I've noticed when I've been studying like my intro to comparative politics course and stuff like that is uh, the differences between flawed and full democracies. So when you were talking about the polarization of American politics as well as Dutch politics, what is it that you can see uh, between the two relations of the nations that the United States is missing in comparison to the Netherlands? Okay, that's a very good question. Thank you. Well, um, of course, I'm an ambassador. Uh, I'm not a political analyst. So if I, if I make critical observations on your country, it doesn't mean that these are observations on behalf of the Netherlands, but I make them on my own personal account. Um, but one of the things that I already mentioned is a two-party system versus a multi-party system. I think much of your political system is based on your declaration of independence and goes back many centuries. Um, it never had an update. Uh, uh, for instance, for us Europeans, it is hard to understand why you can win the popular vote, but not become president. Uh, that has to do, well, I don't have to tell you, you all know much better with the way you have um, set up with the states um, your political system. For us, it's also sometimes difficult to understand why the great state of California has the same numbers as the great state of Wyoming too. And if you look at the number of citizens living there, uh, it's, it's a huge difference. So that is, you know, when it comes to representation, um, th that is something that I'm, I'm I still I'm struggling with to understand if you could not have a better better system. Um, gerrymandering, I think, is something that we look at from the European perspective as how do you do that? And does it still is it real is still representative? So the broader the issues that I'm addressing actually has to do with the representation of your of your voters and do does the will of the voters really reflect you know, the choice of your final uh, government. And um, then I think that voting in the Netherlands is relatively easy. You need an idea and you need to be registered somewhere. And then you can vote either by mail or by ballot. So it's not that complex. And so it depends again per state because that's one of your other big differences. I mean, the federal structure of your country 
is very much different than, you know, we also have provinces, but they're much smaller. And our uh, electoral system is, is, a, is a central system. I mean, you have many differences between states. So, I mean, in general, I would say in some areas, your system might become more um, representative if it, if it will get an, a kind of an update of your electoral system. Yeah. But again, this was my own personal opinion. So <laughs> don't say uh, Dutch governor wants update from American political system because then, <laughs> <laughs> then I have a slight problem. Okay, no, no, no. But you know the context in this. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Oh, okay. Hello. Um, is it on? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah, I think it's on. Okay. First, I'd like to thank you so much for being here, Ambassador. It's really great to hear you talk. Um, my name is Merrick Kong. I, I'm a student here at FIU. I'm a sophomore studying international relations, and I'm here uh, with uh, the Model United Nations team. Um, and I just had some questions. You talked about the kind of levels that exist uh, in the EU, or really for a lot of European countries. You talked partly about you know multi-party systems. And so my question is, how is the Netherlands in particular, or maybe EU states in general, uh, dealing with the various levels of uh, both parliamentary issues where you have multiple parties you have to agree with, uh, and then also at the EU level where you have to agree with other EU members, specifically in the context of NATO. And um, when you're talking, you talked a lot about threats, both from Russia and China. So um, how is the Netherlands going to deal with uh, those multiple threats considering the multiple levels of inhibition or possibly challenging those things? Yeah. Okay. Good question. I think, well, part of it, we can, when it comes to security issues and dealing with security issues, there's part that we can do ourselves. For instance, defense expenditure is an autonomous decision that can be taken by the Netherlands. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, we have uh, agreements, but it's up to the individual member states to decide on how much they want to want to spend on uh, defense. At the same time, it goes without saying that we need a stronger European cooperation in defense as well. That doesn't mean immediately uh, a European army, but it means, for instance, that we can much, much more closely work together between EU member states. And we already do that. I mean, with Belgium, uh, we work together very closely. Uh, with Germany, we work together very closely when it comes to um, uh, uh, military with the UK, we do a lot in the uh, maritime field. Uh, so there is already some kind of division of labor and it would be ridiculous if each individual European country would develop its own drone. So we need a kind of one European kind of drone system, uh, very much I hope in line with the American drone so that you have one market and you have the benefits of scale. So that is important. We have EU battle groups that are available. They've unfortunately never been used, but I could imagine that in the future, you know, individual member states make uh, military staff or equipment available for the EU battle group. That's again, a decision of the individual member state. And then the EU battle group can act on behalf of the EU, but it's complicated uh, because there's the role of the European parliament, there's the role of the national parliaments. But what I foresee is a stronger military cooperation in the uh, defense sector, the security sector. Again, more division of labor, common projects. For instance, there's this famous example that if you would go from a tank with a tank from the Netherlands on the road to a German and you to Germany and you cross a bridge there, that the bridge might not be you know broad enough to have this tank. Uh, uh, it's it's not a good example, but what it means is that we need one. Uh, uh, a mobility project in Europe that we can, you know, much easier work together in the military field. So that's what I'm expecting that's going to happen. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you for your interest. Can we just, um, for a change, take one question from the online audience, please? Yeah. And then it's back to you guys. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon. Um, well, I have a question from Lauren Cibrian. She is uh, a member of the Model European Union team here in uh, our university. Uh, her question is, do you believe that the European Union is prepared in, ter in terms of economic and social aspects for the acceleration on energy independence, taking into consideration that not every member state can afford this accelerated transition? Yeah, um, well, that remains to be seen. I think for now, what we have seen is uh, a great show of solidarity between the EU member states. And we've also seen 
uh, until now that every, every individual member state was willing to take these very tough sanctions that I mentioned in the beginning. So until now, that's okay. But I don't know what's, what's going to happen. We never, nobody knows how long the war will last. Nobody will, knows, uh, will know how long uh, uh, prices will continue to rise. Um, so for now, I think we've done a great job, but I, I cannot predict what the situation will be in one month. I mean, this morning we learned that there are negotiations ongoing uh, between the Russians and the Ukraines. I mean, who knows? I hope that we might have some kind of ceasefire soon and some kind of political arrangement. And if, you know, if, if, if the war stops, that creates an, a whole other uh, perspective again. So, but for now, I think we can use our, because I think there's a firm commitment, whatever happens with the war, to become less energy dependent from, uh, from Russia, because we never want to be in the same situation again. So that's why I think it will be, you know, it will be an impetus for the uh, energy security discussion and also for the transition to a greener economy. Thank you. Um, if you can keep your questions short, because we have lots of interest and we only, if you don't mind, uh, going a few minutes over 5 yeah. p.m. Right? Yeah, that's no problem. I'll, I'll answer shortly as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for coming to speak to us. Uh, my name is Janil. I am a poli sci major here at FIU. Um, my question was more like that the Netherlands is regarded as one of the best countries when it comes to public transportation, more specifically Amsterdam with the bicycles. Um, how can the United States and Miami and any large metropolitan area start taking some of the, the examples from Amsterdam and just the Netherlands in general into having better, more efficient um, public transportation like with bicycles and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, well, but first of all, biking starts at a very young age. You know, children of four or three, four, five, they know how to bike. And then also they go at a very young age by themselves to on Saturday morning, for instance, to their hockey or their soccer club. So if you live in the Netherlands, you'll see many children at a very young, early age going to their school, their sports club, et cetera, et cetera. That, be, that is possible because we have a safe infrastructure. You have separate, separate bike lanes at dangerous crossings. Priority is given to bikers. There are always traffic lights. So that's very much, you need the infrastructure. Um, I realize that we are a flat country. Um, uh, so, you know, when it's very hot or when it's hilly, it becomes more challenging, but it's, pos it's possible. I mean, if you look at our train stations, you can rent a bike everywhere and you can drop your bike everywhere. And that in the United States, especially in the bigger cities, is more and more happening now, which is a good thing. But maybe the most important thing is the culture. I mean, I'm a biker myself and I don't want to blame uh, the American um, car driver, but sometimes they only look at cars and they don't take bikes into account. So it starts actually with respect for the biker uh, and seeing the biker and, uh, you know, uh, having the biker as a, as a complete part of your infrastructure plan and taking the interest of the biker into account when he's on his bike. And even if he doesn't have priority, maybe, you know, he's much more vulnerable than you in your car. So, I mean, take into account the interest of the, of the bike driver and then and that is very important. So the mindset should also change. Yeah. And I guess with rising energy prices, right? Well, we yeah, certainly the link with anyway. climate and green yes. energy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Hello. Oh, well, first, thank you for a wonderful presentation on relations between the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the United States. Yeah. Um, with regards to Russian intervention in Ukraine, my question has to do with international security organizations in Europe, specifically NATO. Um, as a founding member of NATO, I, I wanted to ask, I know there's been a lot of conversation about possible Ukrainian membership into NATO after the intervention. So my question would be, uh, what has NATO stands, what has NATO's um, response to this been, to, to the Russian intervention? Yeah. Well, um, Ukrainian EU membership doesn't solve the current problem. I mean, um, under normal conditions, there is a long trajectory before member states can join. You need to look at your economy, your politics, your judicial, your corruption levels. I mean, there's so many areas that you take into account for about 25 chapters, as they are called, where you have to make progress. Um, that is that is clearly not the case. So I would say a EU or a Ukrainian EU membership doesn't solve the problem. What is clear is that we need to support Ukraine, and we do that in many areas. Um, there is now, and that's already a fast track, a request 
to the European Commission to come up with an AVI, as we call it. So an, an advice to the member states on what should happen, what has to happen if Ukraine wants to join the EU. So we are currently waiting for that AVI to comment on it. But our overall position is that um, despite the, the terrible situation, there are criteria where each country has uh, uh, that each country has to fulfill before. And I understand that those are not in these exceptional circumstances, the normal criteria. Uh, but again, we are very much interested in supporting Ukraine and we already do that in other ways than via an immediate direct EU membership. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hello, Ambassador. My name is Carlos Padilla. I'm studying international relations and political science here at FIU. My question comes from what you were saying about um, Netherlands looking independence from Russia energetically, right? But at the same time, you also mentioned that the Netherlands depends, at the same, same does the United States, economically in trade with China, right? And if we analyze the situation with Russia, would you say that we didn't expect any trouble with Russia after the, the, cold, the end of the Cold War? But again, it happened. And being China, one of these rogue countries as well, how are you? How is the Netherlands planning to create a new independence and trade from these countries? Yeah. Well, first of all, we cannot do that alone. So we always have to work in alliances. Also, when we want to become less dependent from China in certain critical areas, and maybe the most important one is semiconductors. Everything that has to do with semicons. Um, we export a certain chip. Uh, but we also import a lot of, let's say, more simple chips that we need in our cars, in our computers, in our mobile phones and all that. So we want to become less dependent in what we call critical areas. That means that we have to join forces, EU and United States in those areas and work together. And for instance, in Semicon, uh, we, we, we invest much more together than we did in the past. We work together much more than we did in the past. And when it comes to what we call exporting sensitive material, we have more and more one line. So I think that's the best way to deal with the, the dependency of China in certain crucial uh, sectors, including Semicon, to form an alliance and to invest in that alliance. We will never be able probably to be 100% independent from China, but at least, and that was not only with Semicon, but also with you know, vaccines when we had the pandemic and all that, uh, you don't want to be dependent on one country. So we have to, and therefore the EU and the United States are, you know, ideal partners to invest more in the critical sector where we have a common interest. Thank you. Yeah. We're still we okay? About, yeah, we have about 10 minutes. So okay. Hopefully we get through all of you, but yeah. please keep it short. Sweet. <laughs> oh my God, it's going to fall. Oh. Take it off. Oh. Yeah. Hi, thank you, um, Ambassador. Um, thank you for coming here and taking your time to teach us and talk um, a little about, about Nether the Netherlands. Um, I wanted to ask you that um, how, how will you um, judge or like analyze the, how the US has responded so far um, towards Ukraine and Russia? And how Europe um, has also responded to it? Is it sanctions a viable solution for the situation that's happening over there and what do you think could be a better idea to assess the situation yeah well i think i think the us has done a great job uh but when i and europe as well but when i say that i realize that it's that it's at the same time um not enough to stop the war and to stop the human suffering suffering of the Ukrainian people. So, you know, the crucial question, of course, is what can you do to stop the war without getting into a scenario where you further escalate the war? And that's a very thin line. Uh, and I think we, Europe, United States, have walked that thin line very well um, because we don't know what the next step of Russia might be. Uh, if you look at nuclear weapons, they have more nuclear weapons. They have most nuclear weapons in the world. And we don't want to get into a confrontation, uh, in a nuclear confrontation. At the same time, we also want to stop this. And that's why we, United States and Europe, have chosen for all the measures that I just mentioned. So I think until now we've done a, we've done a good job. But I say that with pain in my heart because it hasn't stopped the suffering of the Ukrainian people and the war. So that's why we, you know... Um, maybe other countries can play a role as well. 
countries like Turkey, Israel. It's very important what China does. China has abstained from voting in the UN for supporting the resolution, uh, but it will not be acceptable if they undermine the sanctions as well. So they could also use their influence to, uh, to talk to the Russians and to stop this aggression. I have uh, much respect for many European leaders, including our current presidency, uh, the French president uh, Macron, who continues to talk to, uh, to Putin under these very uh, difficult circumstances. So I hope that one way or another, Russia will come to reason and stop. But until now, I think the American administration has done a great job. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sadie Testaseka and I'm a third year student here at FIU studying international relations with a concentration in human rights. I'm also part of the Model UN team. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for this excellent presentation. And my question relates to supranationalism in Europe. You were talking about how the Netherlands was a founding member of the European uh, Steel and Coal Commission, which ultimately grew into the European Union. Seeing as the progress from the small like trading alliance into the supranational organization today, what do you think the trajectory of such organizations will be in the future? Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, I, I think there will be a tendency towards increased uh, integration and cooperation between the EU member states. You actually see that now already in the field of finance. There are the, 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 the consequence of the financial crisis was that we have euro bonds now. Um, that was not the case before that. So there is an increased cooperation in the financial section. Security, I already mentioned as an example. We won't have a European army, but we will have stronger EU cooperation. Having said that, if you want to have support for the EU, it is essential that in all the individual member states, um, decisions that can be taken at that level will be taken by that level, eh? the subsidiarity principle. So don't let Brussels decide on things that we can decide in our own countries or even at our local or provincial level. Leave that up to uh, the, the individual member states. But where you have uh, challenges that are much broader. I mentioned climate, the financial market, security issues, and many more issues that has to be done in a European level. So my expectation is, uh, and supranationality is, a, is, a, is always a bit of a risky word because some people then have the idea that you lose your independence. Well, we are not independent anymore. We are so much dependent on Brussels and on Europe as a whole that this that it's for each and every individual country a fiction that you can be completely independent from the outside world. And I think brave politicians should address that as well. So I'm expecting more steps towards closer co European cooperation into the area of finance and uh, uh, security, but also when it comes to health and the COVID response, pandemic responses, we will work, work much more closer together because we have learned from the pandemic that ordering masks by individual countries doesn't work, that uh, investing in a vaccine by individual countries doesn't work, that if you want to buy on the global market your vaccines, you have to do it at the EU as a whole and not as Netherlands, Belgium, blah, blah, blah. so that is, I think, what we, will Europe ever become like the United States? No, I don't think so. Well, not in my lifetime. Mm. And I don't think in your lifetime either. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It will take centuries. We're at 5 p.m. Do you have five more minutes? No, no, no thank I'm you. Okay. Can, but please, I don't want you to. You're the last two lucky ones. And then um, please, you can just post two more to the ambassador. And, and you still had, a, you have the last question. Because you, with your food, you can't walk to the mic. So I'll, I'll bring the mic to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hello, sir. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you for coming here. Uh, my name is Daniel Rotker. I'm uh, in my junior year and majoring in political science. I'm also in MUN, like several people who have just spoken. My question relates to, to international economies and uh, governmental forms in the future. Um, we've noticed that um, data has shown recently that the United States here uh, is experiencing a bit of democratic backsliding. We've also seen that overall democratic means have lost favorability while authoritarian means have gained in favorabilities. Um, and this, again, this Russia-Ukraine situation is uh, an example of that. Russia is gaining ground, but more with China who is, uh, has their eyes on Taiwan. Um, and they're also the second largest economy and have been gaining on the United States. Um, overall, do you believe 
Um, well, because China's economy is more manufacturing based. Whereas um, countries like the United States, uh, European countries like the Netherlands um, and Western countries we would consider Western are, uh, they have companies such as Google, they have companies such as Amazon, Apple. There's also car companies that are developed in countries like these. Um, while we are more IP based countries, whereas uh, more authoritarian countries are manufacturing based. So my question is, even if uh, countries like China take over and are the leaders in the world economy, do you believe that more Western countries will lose their prevalence because of what we have? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, you should diversify a little bit. In some, in some areas, we still have a huge advantage. And you mentioned tech and tech companies. Uh, if you look at 5G in China, you have Huawei. You don't have many 5G companies in, uh, in the United States. You have a few. Uh, in Europe, but not on the same scale. So that's, I think, on 5G, where we are, have challenges with China. If you look at artificial intelligence, uh, China does very well. Um, I just want to give the example of solar and solar panels, where the Chinese solar panels flooded the European and the uh, American markets because they could produce much below market rates, and they have now taken over. So, I mean, uh, I, I think we, again, have to work together and critical areas that includes, by the way, everything that has to do with rare earth materials. Uh, there will be a scarcity in some of them. And those materials we need for our computers, our mobiles, our cars, our air, airplane industry and all that. My personal opinion is that we will, the gap between China and the West will gradually be reduced. If you look at the scale of China, the market, the number of students that leave the university there every day, every, every year, I mean, and that's that's okay uh, because it's going to happen. That's inevitable. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to be dependent on China uh, in crucial areas. So that is where we have to uh, have to uh, invest in. Uh, and also, I think we want to stay ahead of the curve. So it is crucial. And I come back again to this example of Semicon that you continue to invest in your semicon industry and that you continue to train, that you continue to do research and development so that every step that you make, you remain a, a few steps ahead of the Chinese competitor. And that requires large investment in material and in brains. And that is the challenge I think that we do. And again, we have to do that challenge between Europe and the United States, but also countries like Japan, South Korea, their active partners. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ralph. I'm uh, originally from the Netherlands. Um, so I'm studying international relations as well. And I'm trying to get into Dutch government because I have to go back once my study is over. Would you have like any advice for someone trying to get into Dutch government at my age? Yeah, so you, you have a Dutch passport? Yes, okay. yes. Well, good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Another compatriot. Um, no, I think if I focus on the Dutch diplomatic service, there are a few things that you need. You need to be Dutch. You need to have a background in an academic background. You need to speak your languages, at least two, but preferably more. Uh, but those are certain criteria. Uh, what is most important, I think, if you want to become diplomat is that you like to network, that you like to deal with people, uh, that you are very socially, that you have a social broad interest uh, about many subjects because the diplomat can work one year, you know, one period of three, four years on uh, disarmament issues, but the next year you work uh, on an economy. Uh, you are being transferred, you, your partner, your family from one country to another country. So you should be aware, well, you should be interested in people as a good diplomat and you should be aware that if you choose a career in the diplomatic service, it's not only your career, it's also the career of your partner. And sometimes it's not easy for your partner to work abroad as well. So you have to make a compromise. Uh, and you take your children to international schools. You know, they have to like that. They have, after three or four years, they have to go back again to the Netherlands or to another country. So that requires a lot from your family as well. So you should be aware of that if you want to invest in a diplomatic career, but I'm happy to give you some advice uh, after this. Uh, yes. After thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I would like to give yes, one. Please more go question. ahead. Go okay. ahead. I'll I'll bring the, the time and you oh, she has the mic already. Okay, yes. very good. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Being a woman and also being an economist, I was very much interested in 
food security and if you were going to talk anything about it, okay? Because before the Ukraine crisis, we were all aware that there is a global food, uh, food security problem. That were, and, but the Ukraine crisis aggravated this food security. And as far as I remember at the G7 meeting, ministers meeting, uh, there was a call to the countries that they should not restrict their food export markets and they should leave it open. But Hungary, Argentina, and I think Indonesia and several other countries are already taking precautions in their export markets by restricting the agriculture exports. Mm -hmm. Is there is a plan of the West or the European Union for food security? This will be a huge problem in my mind. Yeah. I mean, they can come to an agreement on the war, but the food security is still going on. Yeah. Do you mean food security on the global level? The global issue, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a global problem. Yeah. And, and as far as I know, Ukraine and Russia were the bread baskets of North Africa and Middle East. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And concerned with the, of course, fertilizer, yeah. put Belarus into the picture also. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't have an answer on that. I mean, I share your worries and it's already clear that uh, because they are the biggest producers of wheat, uh, there will be a shortage of wheat and bread. It will be translated in higher prices. Uh, and it's, it's, it's for sure that people will not only have to pay more for their bread and their spaghetti and everything where you need wheat in, but also that for some people it will be very difficult to get their daily ration of, of bread of, of, of products. Um, and and that's something is on top of the pandemic. They yes, already I know, went I know. Yeah. Stress. It is something that we certainly are looking at, again, at the EU level, but also with the United States. But I'm afraid that it might require more food support for countries in Africa, uh, in other parts of the world. Unfortunately, it comes on top of the COVID crisis. It comes on top of the cl climate crisis. It makes it very difficult in certain areas for African farmers to grow their products. So I, I don't have an answer on that, apart from the fact that we are aware of it and that I think that we have a responsibility, uh, EU and the United States, but other countries that can afford it as well, to come up with compensatory compensation for these countries. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Haskell. Um, that was a great exchange. You saw the interest. Um, I'm sorry that I couldn't. Uh, we couldn't get to your questions online, and you know uh, other questions. But I'm sure if you don't mind staying around for five more minutes, for there were a couple of other folks who actually also wanted to ask questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you really gave us a wonderful impression of the active political role that the Netherlands play in the EU, and for sure uh, it's very important given these uh, truly challenging geopolitical times. So thank you very much. Give please give everyone a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, and please, so um, if you find this interesting, um, the EU Center, we have a lot of events always going on. Um, please check out M Miami EUC or EU Center, Miami EUC.fiu. And um, you can sign there up also for our monthly announcements. Next week, we have another great uh, virtual conference, Wednesdays, on social inclusion and societal diversity in Europe, further tackling issues, you know, regarding to ethnic, social, and other minorities, and um, youth politics, and so on and so on. So please um, stay in touch. Thank you very much, very much again. Thanks to our community sponsoring partner, and um, have a good rest of the day. Take care.